The central question of FX's mind-bending new X-Men adaptation, Legion, is the nature of main character David Haller's mind. David has been languishing for years in a mental hospital, convinced that the voices he hears and the past supernatural occurrences he remembers are schizophrenic hallucinations. I'm insane, you idiot. But soon, David learns the truth. He's a mutant. David, your whole life people have told you you were sick. What if I told you that's a lie? What if I told you every memory you have of mental illness, voices, hallucination, was just your power? Every strange happening in his life is called into question. Are his memories the result of a broken mind, or are they manifestations of his vast telepathic and telekinetic ability? The definition of an unreliable narrator, David struggles to distinguish between past and present, memory and imagination, reality and insanity. Can his mind or anything the audience sees be trusted? I, I have to know. Is, is this... Is this real? What stands out about Legion is the way its visual storytelling translates David's confusion, anxiety, and disjointed thinking for the screen. Through experimental use of camera work, editing, sound, transition, and lighting to represent David's questionable grasp on reality, Legion constantly requires viewers to challenge what they see and hear. These cinematic devices also illustrate how his powers form a unique lens through which he perceives the world. This creative window into David's mind might inspire us to look inward at our personal dreams and worldviews, as well as the monsters that may lurk beneath the surface, to determine whether our subjective realities could be the key to unlocking our own superpowers. Legion's out-of-the-box camera work and editing not only places us in David's mindset and keeps us questioning, but they also imbue the visuals with deeper symbolic meaning. Standard third-person shots give way to first-person views when we are meant to see as David does. Images of childhood are displayed as if they are idyllic home movies. David is seen through security cameras and from behind glass as both other characters and viewers observe and study him. Often, events will switch from a full-screen perspective to a cinematic widescreen one. This suggests the alternating nature of reality and fantasy and reminds the audience that what they see may be untrustworthy, a fiction. Variable speed of action, speeding up and slowing down on a whim, further distorts reality and mimics a feeling of insanity or feeling out of control for those watching. These camera techniques take the cinematic concept of point of view to the extreme. Far deeper than just seeing through David's eyes, we're seeing the world via the filter of his very unusual mind. When superpowers come into the equation, this filter becomes more like a kaleidoscope. When David's mind enters Sydney's body, the camera zooms through David's eye into his mind. His memories are put on display as they leave his body and enter hers. As their worlds are figuratively turned upside down, the camera literally turns upside down to convey this to the viewer. When nightmares plague David, he levitates his bed while his mind flashes through jumbled memories. Text suddenly appears on the screen and we see his mind actually go down the rabbit hole. When David reaches out with his mind to find his sister Amy, he levitates Sydney and himself off the ground and they disappear in a flash of light. They reappear as ghostly projections, watching Amy as she is interrogated, only to disappear once more, shown as water droplets hitting the surface as they rematerialize in a lake. In each of these examples, the use of superpowers is expressed symbolically with their distortion of reality on display, driving home the notion that what we are seeing transcends or bends natural laws of physics we take for granted. These visual choices are often juxtaposed with sound that's out of sync with what's being shown. Did he ask about me? As a telepath, David, and thereby the audience, can hear characters speak without ever saying a word. And yet the police say they found no noose in the apartment, just rope burns on your neck. The voices that plague him whisper in our ears. Or build to a scream. It's unclear whether these are minds he's reading or creations of insanity. In his dreams, voices call out to David that are unassociated with what he is seeing. David? I got it, I got it, I got it. David. Like the action, voices slow down and speed up. Or hold the phone, yogurt. And clonopin. That'll... A cocktail. Sometimes people speak and no sound is produced at all. 
Other times, no one speaks, yet through David's telepathy, we still hear them. You are cute, though. At one point, the whole show even becomes a silent movie, complete with dialogue cards. The jarring disassociation of sound from the physical act of speaking keeps us questioning whether, far from being just mad, David might see deeper truths than the rest of us. Like David, we can't know for sure. We can't access objective reality or a definitive answer beyond his subjective perception. Much of Legion takes place within David's memory. Sometimes David is merely recalling a past event. Sometimes he's dreaming. David even visits an astral plane that exists somewhere between memory and dream. And thanks to the powers of memory artist Tonomy, David and others walk consciously through the landscape of his mind as if his memories are rooms in a house. The appearance of this landscape is often indistinguishable from that of reality. But instead of an abstract concept, memory is made into a tangible physical space. And the character's ability to go back and interact with that space suggests that while our memories may define us, we also have the ability to look back and redefine them. The frequent alternation between the present and memories of different periods of David's life aims to confuse viewers. Are we seeing the present, a dream, a fantasy, or a memory? Or is it all of them at once? Impulses sent from nerve endings, electricity in the brain, real fake, it's all the same. Quick cuts blur the line between each. Scenes switch back and forth at lightning speed, causing the same disorientation in time for the audience that David experiences trying to pass his reality. While these abrupt cuts cause confusion, the slower, smoother transitions between scenes also serve to make memory, reality, and fantasy difficult to distinguish. Here, cutting between shots is avoided. Scenes fade into one another, or the camera pans from one to the next. The seamlessness indicates a fluidity of time, as well as the truth that for David and for us, past, present, and dreams aren't as separate as we like to think. They all flow into each other to create a continuous consciousness, which defines our deeper identities and how we see the world. The colors blue and red, especially in lighting, convey David's mental state and split self as he wrestles with his inner monster. The show eventually reveals that David's madness is the result of his psyche at war with a parasitic psychic monster that infected his mind when he was just a baby. This monster is actually a mutant, like David, named Amal Farouk, who is called the Shadow King. It's a mutant, like me. This monster takes many forms, the yellow-eyed man, a horrifying storybook character, and even appears to David as his friend Lenny. We're intended to associate blue light with the expression of David's true self. When we see blue light, we know that David, and not the monster, is in control. This is made clear when David uses Carrie's device to trap the monster and regains control of his mind in a blinding flash of blue light. Blue is indicative of clarity, truth, and calm. When scenes feature blue light, David's seeing things as they are, whether in the real world or within his memories. David even takes the blue drug, vapor, to clear and calm his mind. Why is it blue? <laughs> it's always blue. In the astral plane, Oliver seeks to provide David with clarity and safety from his mind within the Blue Ice Fortress, while outside of the safety of the fortress is where David encounters the monster. Red represents the opposite. Scenes are lit red to indicate fear and loss of control. When red is mentioned or we see red light, we know that the monster is taking hold of David's mind, obscuring the truth and feeding David's fears. The Shadow King and the color red appear in moments of anger and desperation, with uncontrolled use of David's power. As demons try to claw their way through the wall of David's mind, the crack in the wall seeps red like blood. The storybook that contains the monster, the world's angriest boy, reads, To bed, she said, his face turned red. Lenny's line foreshadows the monster taking on her form. Red leather, yellow leather. When Sydney enters David's body and loses control of his powers, the mental hospital is cast in red. With no ability to hold back David's demons, Sydney loses control of his abilities, killing the real Lenny in the process. The two colors also play off each other within the same scenes or the same shots to illustrate their opposing symbolic relationship. In the show's opening scene, alternating red and blue lights from the police car illuminate the teenage David's face as he begins his descent into madness. 
it's an immediate visualization of the two sides of his mind at war. The same MRI machine scans him with both red and blue light. As the monster takes hold, sections of David's brain scan, first shown in blue, light up in red. When Sidney and David run from the Shadow King within David's mind, they run towards the blue light and away from the red. And when the it makes itself known in the astral plane, red light seeps through the windows into the blue room and then pours out as the door opens upon the monster. These colors serve as a wordless touchstone for the audience to distinguish truth from lies and David from the monster. Before the Shadow King is ever revealed, we intuitively understand that the dichotomy between the two colors represents an important split within David. The color symbolism underlines the show's ability to communicate in a visual, emotional language beyond words, to help us enter David's mind and experience these questions on a deeper, primal level. In our world, most of us have no psychic powers, but David's world demonstrates that perhaps we take for granted the power we have over our own realities. How much of what we believe to be true is a lie we tell ourselves, and how many of our impossible dreams could actually be within our reach if we simply chose to believe them? David's struggle with his monster is literal, but his struggle reveals the two sides we have in each of us. Within our lives, our memories and our dreams, we all have both red and blue. The red are the dark thoughts that haunt our sleep, the confusion, fears and doubts that make us feel as if we have no control. The blue, the truest versions of ourselves, the things that make us who we are on our most fundamental level. That no monster can change, awake or asleep. Just as David ultimately excises his monster from his psyche, we too can cast out our fears and embrace our truest selves if we believe we have the power.